Welcome to the next episode of The Existential Files. Hello, Louis. Hello, Matthew. Just checking we're recording. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get straight into it. Uh, we're joined yep. today by another very special guest. Um, so it's Yannick Jakob. Is that pronounced correctly, Yannick? Not uh, close enough, Jakob. Uh, but uh, most people still g go by Yannick Jacob. So um, I, I'm, I'll be happy with Peter if you want. But uh... <laughs> we could call you whatever you wish. <laughs> remind, this remind me of um, that's where I show my biblical biblical lack of knowledge. Where you know, is it who was is it Peter? Was somebody else? But they changed the name to Peter, and there's somebody else. Why why do they change the names when they start following Jesus? Come on, come on, Louis. You'll know this. Whew. No, he's gone. Why, okay. he's not why, why do they change? Well, I mean, if you're talking about Saul becoming Paul, I mean, um, that was because he was a, a Jew killer and then he had his, you know, <laughs> it, it wasn't great going around killing Jews and stuff. So, you know, if you're going to be following being a Christian, so I think that was one of the main reasons he changed his name. But anyway, this is not a, a religious slight podcast. We're a, a slight we're, we're, digression. So, uh, so should we ask, should we ask Yannick to tell, tell us about himself then? Is that right? Let's do that. Yannick, tell us about yourself. <laughs> Hi. Who are you? Uh, yeah. Um, well, uh, I'm. Where to start? Who Who am I? You know, you have to start with these existential questions. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, no, but like the simple answer would be, uh, I'm uh, came here from Germany a while ago um, in the pursuit of studying psychology and the human mind, and that led me to uh, become a coach, um, drawing quite far into kind of the therapeutic realm. Uh, I work as a mediator as well. I um, teach at the University of East London. I teach uh, coaching psychology and uh, positive psychology. I run trainings for people to uh, become life and business coaches. Um, I work a little bit in education. I uh, have a leg in corporate training, working with leaders, uh, introducing these existential questions. Um, and generally like to make or help people think and uh, think a bit more deeply, think differently about stuff and uh, kind of embrace all of the shit that's going on in life, all of the lemons uh, that life gives us and curveballs it throws at us, uh, so we can perhaps live uh, happier, uh, and not just in terms of feeling good, but in terms of embracing the whole spectrum of what people are going through in life. And existentialism has, uh, has added uh, enormous amounts to the way I think about the world and people and myself and relationships and all of that. Brilliant. And I think that's what's really interesting, or one of the many interesting things about where your interests lie. And I think how they link to the kinds of ideas we may talk about on the podcast, because you mentioned there two areas of interest, positive psychology, particularly in relation to coaching and existentialism. So you have an approach to coaching or bringing this idea of um, how we might apply positive psychology with this kind of existential slant. Is that would, would that describe some element of what you do? Yeah, I think I think um, I I embedded like I've I studied existentialism after I went through a positive psychology school. So I went through masters and studied for years uh, what is right with people and what is well-being all about. And uh, then I wanted to uh, work with people doing that. Um, but I I thought positive psychology was a bit limited um, because there 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 was a certain depth that I felt was was lacking. Uh, a guy called Lazarus once called it a movement without legs, um, and that that said like, well, there's something missing really that that uh, gives you a foundation of what life is really about, you know. Uh, so for me, I wanted to use all of that positive psychology stuff, but I didn't want to ignore, uh, like I said, all of the curveballs, all the lemons, you know. Life life's really tough, you know. Life's a challenge, and there's there's a lot of the dark side uh, to life and to existence, and so I wanted to combine that. So. Working with people, I wanted to integrate uh, coaching and psychotherapy. So um, there wasn't really any training. There is now, but there wasn't any training at the time. Uh, so the closest I've got was uh, existential coaching. Uh, so somebody said, like, well, he has an, uh, an approach to coaching uh, that goes quite deep. And that is about the big questions in life. And said, well, that, that sounds really up my street. So I checked it out. And uh, that felt really right. And then... I, uh, after I, I went and dove, uh, dived deep into the whole philosophy of it, I realized that uh, that is exactly what I was looking for, something that people can relate to, something that is real, but something that I can look through a positive psychology lens uh, and 
and kind of see the value in it, see see the the pot potential for liberation and the potential for for people living a, a good life, like a real life, um, a life full of challenges, but in in essence, a positive life. And that's why it interests me, and I want to sort of bring Louis back into this then, because Louis, we've um, had conversations before about at least what we understand positive psychology to be. And I know that you have your, let's use the word, maybe skepticism, suspicions, uncertainty about what positive psychology as a, let's use the word, discipline or movement, maybe trying to um, bring about. And here then you've got uh, Yannick Train saying, okay, existentialism, these ideas very much can link in with those, those ideas and brought together, maybe that's a route of giving more meaning to positive psychology. Is that a route maybe we could take you in? Or again, are we still kind of have these concerns about the positive psychology side of it? Well, I, I definitely, I think I, I'd like to hear more about um, uh, Yannick's take on positive psychology before we delve into, because for me, I mean, I, you know, I'm an existentialist. I mean, I definitely find a great deal of sympathy in existentialism. And um, I think it, it is an extremely powerful way of looking at the world and an and, and undeniably correct way of looking at the world to, to be <laughs> honest um but you know and it, it, i mean i sometimes think of it as a universal acid that you can pour on everything and, and in some ways it, it, it can affect everything um but before we get into the existential side i'd definitely like to hear yannick's um take on positive psychology because you know we've we've done quite a few podcasts now discussing positive psychology I've, you know, I've done a bit of reading. I'm not a positive psychologist. I don't have any any real knowledge about the area, and I do find it slightly suspicious, you know, uh, as a as an area. So, Yannick, do you want to try and make me less suspicious of positive psychology? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd love to explore suspicions, but uh, before we get into that, perhaps my my take on it is uh, well, first and foremost, it's a science. It's a branch of science that uh, decided that it's useful to uh, scientifically and empirically. Um, look at what's right with people, um, to look at uh, how can we uh, not just fix what's wrong, but build on resources, build on strengths, uh, build on positive emotions rather than making negative ones go away. You know, look at how we can, uh, how we can uh, increase uh, optimism or build a more optimistic mindset, a more positive mindset, you know, growth mindset. Um, looking at what can we actually create in terms of tools and interventions to increase well-being and what the fuck is well-being you know what is happiness because if you it's like love if you ask 20 different people you get 20 different answers of what what happiness is so it was really useful for me particularly in in relation to coaching to explore the question of of what people mean when they say i want to be happier or want to feel better and particularly I, I realized that every client i've had ever so far if you if you looked at what they wanted to achieve, at the the end goal of that was always some form of feeling good or better. So I, it was really useful to have the psych positive psychology vocabulary and research in terms of what are the elements and the pillars of what a good life is or what well-being and different forms of well-being are about. Um, so that in essence is it, like scientific findings of what well-being is and uh, how can we draw on resources how can we actually influence it and apply it and I, and, I, and I guess you know again my, my suspicions are at the very base of, of the you know the, the constructs about things like you know is, is there such a thing as a as a as how you know as a universal happiness you know uh, uh, and uh, and what is it value laden? This is one of my suspicions. You know, if if say the Nazis had won the war, for example, would would we have a, a Nazi positive psychology? And would that <laughs> would, and would that look the same? And I and I kind of am a little bit suspicious if it if it wouldn't look the same. Do you know what I mean? Do you? Do you, yeah, do you, do you the thing is, when we when we do research, as good researchers do, and uh, arguably there's a lot of really bad research in positive psychology because it's so popular and there's a lot of money in it. But uh, if you look at the good pieces of research, they actually look at different cultures and uh, cultures where, when you say it's value laden, you know where where the values are different. And then if we do enough research, we can actually start to arrive at certain shared culturally independent uh, elements. Um, of well-being that that seem to really matter across uh, cultures. And, and Louis, you come to that question about it being value laden, then, and I think that's when the issues come back to these big questions about um, because Yannick introduced it as being scientific, 
and therefore as much as that psychology as a discipline is scientific then positive psychology is attempting to try and bring that approach to these those elements of human experience which traditionally had not been looked at as much within psychology uh, they had been explored but not maybe quite as much as, as some would argue they could have been and this notion of something being value late if, if the idea is to then say okay how we can use these ideas to help raise well-being in, in different ways and explore well-being with a view of maybe we can apply this to raise our own and other people's well-being that by its definition suggests it, it probably is value laden so it is the, is the suspicion that it's is it a science as such is that where some of the suspicions maybe lie well, yeah i mean let me put it another way i mean i'm very suspicious of psychiatry <laughs> and i think that psychiatry and, and actually my partner is a psychiatrist and we and we continuously have debates about you know what, what she thinks she's doing for a living and what, how, how I see what she's doing. And although the motivation is to help her patients, you know, I'm not entirely convinced that, that, that what she's doing is, is informed by science, even though you know, she can say this drug has this evidence backing it up. Well, lithium is the rarest element in the universe. <laughs> not sure I can see why it would have any kind of biological significance, you, if, if you get what I'm saying. So, you know, do people under the, you know, if you say you're helping people, if you think you're doing science, that's all well and good. But, uh, you know, uh, again, and this is why I'm a more of an existentialist than, than I am a, a scientist anymore, because mm, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, evolution doesn't produce perfect working beings. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there, science, there, there, science, yeah. Science, science can only go that far. You know, sure. um, I think science is limited in terms of uh, how we can really arrive at knowledge. I think to arrive at some real knowledge, we need to combine science and philosophy and common sense and spirituality. Um, it, science is only one element of it. And uh, the questions that positive psychologists uh, have been exploring, they're not new questions. They have been around for thousands of years. And, uh, you know, it's just the, the way that we've been exploring these questions is new, you know, using the scientific method. Um, that that's that was uh, what positive psychologists have actually contributed to to the literature. And with one word in there, what you said that I was drawn to, because I know it's also been picked up. I want to say in the conversation with Itai, so again, somebody who has got shared interest there in terms of positive psychology and some other related ideas. And one that you mentioned was spirituality. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of almost sort of second guessing where Louis might go when he hears that word, thinking, well. If we're looking at ideas that relate to spirituality, is that something that science can look at? Is it something quite different? Because there's overlaps between science and philosophy. You know, one has emerged out of the other, I would say, and they link those kinds of questions. And spirituality to me is something that I am fascinated by, even if I say as a so-called psychologist, as a human, you know, what, what role do we see that could be playing in terms of why is spirituality important? when we're looking at those kinds of questions? Because I, 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 I sense there is, yet we're back to the question of what do we mean by spirituality, something being spiritual? And I shut you both up now. <laughs> I, I'm gonna, yeah, I mean, I'm going to let Yannick respond to that, obviously, because, you know, he's, he's our guest today. And so uh, I'm happy to. Um, I, I'm interested in what he has to say. Uh, <laughs> the first thing that came to mind, actually, was uh, during my, my training as an existential coach, uh, there was a module um, and one particular lecture was an online module on, on health and well-being, and one of the topics was spirituality. And uh, there we were, about uh, 10 of us, um, discussing away online, and uh, the conclusion that I drew from what everybody had to say about spirituality, um, from a more philosophical point of view, was... It doesn't really mean anything, and it also means everything. Um, it, it just like it left me with a complete uh, lack of um, sense for how how do I see spirituality, and because everybody again everybody had their own take on it and what it means. Um, the scientific uh, exploration of, of spirituality is a lot more interesting in that sense, in terms of uh, here are different voices that have made sense of it in a, in a certain way, and. I haven't dived into that topic as much. Uh, that's that Itai is a specialist in in that area, but um, I, I do think that uh, there's a lot of value in spirituality in, because a lot of people always take it um, compared to religion. You know, you're religious or you're spiritual um, in terms of a belief in something that is uh, bigger, that is larger, something that is there that we can't quite 
explore or grasp with uh, or observe you know or measure uh, with a scientific method you know it's something that is much more subjective much more personal and uh, that I find really important for people to explore because that means they need to find their own answers. There, there is no general answer that science can find for them and then they read a book and then they understand themselves. It's a, it's a process of exploring what your core values and your core beliefs are, what's important to you, what do you believe? You know, how can you bridge uncertainty with a, with a certain faith? Um, not a religious faith necessarily, but just um, believing in something that you can't prove, you know. And and here we are, right in the air, in the middle of existential philosophy. Uh, and of course, uh, go on then, Louis. well, I was going to say, well, of course, the ex existentialism. I mean, we, we there are you know religious existentialists, but and uh, although it's generally conceived, I would say, or portrayed as a, a as an atheist philosophy, mm. there are religious there are religious existentialists. I mean, Kierkegaard, yeah, like, like the first one. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, and uh, but so I ask you. I mean, and this is a, a question I've been asking a number of our guests. You know, what, if you don't mind, you obviously don't have to answer these questions, Yannick. But you know, do you have any kind of religious belief, or you know, a, because you know, for example, when we were talking to Itai, he he said to us that you know he was he felt almost. I mean, I don't think I'm putting words in his mouth to say he felt one with the universe, and. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you can you give us your take on things and then we can discuss existentialism once we kind of know your take if that's yeah sure um i think that's one of the tenets of existential philosophy is that uh people that you should reject dogma and uh, find answers for yourself so um i i don't follow any book um i don't follow any uh, any belief system that somebody once created and then said well this is a good belief system you should totally believe in it um, I do believe, so I don't follow an organized religion, I do believe that there are certainly uh, things, forces, elements uh, that we, that are beyond uh, what we can perceive. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there um, that that we can't quite make sense of and that we can only believe in. I do believe in some form of, I don't want to say like a, a conscious higher power, I do, I, I like the idea of like a, a live stream or um, I, I do think that um, there is a certain universal connectedness. Um, I can't quite put a picture of it. I have a certain picture in my mind uh, that once kind of emerged, um, but it's impossible for me to put into words. Um, so I, I do believe in a, in a certain universal connectedness, but I don't believe in like, a certain higher being that is sitting somewhere, existing somewhere, kind and, of having a divine plan. And can I ask you then, you know, just to clarify that, because I mean, I see, uh, because I mean, I, I, uh, it's very well stated in all these podcasts, you know, and I, I'm a bit of an atheist, nihilist, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, for me, I do see a camaraderie of sentient beings, you know, and I, I, one of the images I have is an alien species and we meet it and we hug each other, crying into our arms, you know, <laughs> meeting another, meeting another species that gets the fucking shit of the universe, you know what I mean? It's nice to meet someone who understands. Um, but you're not talking, are you talking about a kind of camaraderie of sentience or are you talking about something more than that? Um, I think if we ever meet another species, I don't think it will be very camaraderie. Um, I I saw this uh, this piece by um, um, uh, wow, where has his name gone? Astrophysicist uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, yeah. who said that you know, given that we are so extremely close to apes and we are just like a tiny bit more advanced than them. Um, if there is a species out there and they're only just that tiny bit more advanced than we are advanced to ape, compared to apes, then it for them talking to us would be like us spending an afternoon with an ape, you know? Um, so <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not sure if we can relate to, to that kind of uh, species uh, in, in that way. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, there's... There's certainly there's certainly something out there. I mean, the, the likelihood is quite there, but um, I, I don't think there's uh, somebody sitting there or any kind of being sitting there that has made a plan or the universe has a certain outcome and we are all going towards that. I can't know that for sure, but um, I, I think there's a certain randomness to the world. 
We, we well, seem to be visited by a random, a <laughs> we're a random noise. So, excuse me one second. I'm going to go quiet for a second. So we can have a little chat while before he gets um, while we're waiting for him to get back. I mean, um, could you could uh, you clarify your question maybe? Because yeah, uh, I, I, well, I, I mean, I was to, I, what I was contrasting it with, and, and for me, I mean, I, you know, I, I I come at it from a kind of evolutionary um, psychology perspective, mm -hmm. you know. And, and uh, you know, obviously, aliens are going to have a completely different um, evolutionary history. But I do think that existentialism. I mean, I say on my blog, uh, you know, which is everything is pointless. I think that in every sentient species, we'll have an everything is pointless dot com. Mm -hmm. you, you know, and and in a way, but I I don't see an overarching. You know, there's nothing connecting us except we're all in the same universe. We all, you know, and, and that if if. If you have a, a self that communicates, that wants to communicate that idea to other people, I think that there will be other, other everythingispointless.coms out there. And so the, the, the question I was kind of asking you is, you know, when you were talking about some kind of, you know, force or something, is, is that that there's a, a commonality to existence? Or is it something which I, I mean I might label as you know supernatural or and and supernatural I guess isn't isn't to denigrate it it's to say it's you know we can't see it it's but but, it, but it's there yeah I don't believe in some force that is guiding us all um, I do believe that we're connected and I do believe that uh, you know there there is no overarching point to our existence but whenever we feel a connectedness to another human being that that's there's a point that's meaningful you know what whatever yeah. we experience at this very moment um we can attach meaning to that sure and, and i guess that that was this is my my the point of my question is is where, because i mean you know and i again i hope i'm not putting words in itai's mouth but i do feel that itai was kind of look thinking about maybe a universal force Impo you know, and, and if we could put it simply, you know, as in intelligence coming before matter, even, you know, and you know, uh, okay. and from what I think maybe what you're saying there is maybe more along what I would saying that that this is a it, it come, you know, obviously there's matter and then comes intelligent beings, and I don't think that there are the universe is designed to make intelligent beings. Yeah, I don't think Itai would have talked about like a, f a higher force that connects us all. I think uh, Itai comes more from a position of we are all inherently connected. And when he says he feels at one with everything, you know, then he feels part of uh, this what world, universe, species, whatever it is. Everything is connected in that sense. And I can I can see how how people feel like that because. Uh, at times I've, I've felt uh, like that and uh, I believe that you can reach a state where you feel inherently connected with everything and that is inherently meaningful in itself once you once you started to feel that kind of connection not just to another human being or to um, uh, but not just to a family but uh, to every human being and then beyond every human being to everything that exists in the world and and I and I and I and I and I don't disagree with that. I mean, I I'm a very visual person, and I, I and I see, you know, I mean, I can see, I I see everything, you know, and I don't and I'm not overstating it, saying thinking, you know, but again, um, I think I like to distinguish between, and and we do talk to people who perhaps believe that there is some kind of force in the universe, you know, uh, and coming at it from a parapsychology perspective that Matt and I come at it from in our past, again, you know, there are people out there who believe that the universe is designed to produce life, you know, versus other, you know, other people who don't take that perspective. So again, I think it's, it's interesting to discuss these points. Yeah. Well, it, it might we, be, that's, that's the thing, you know, uh, we just don't know. Um, I, I've seen an eight year old once trying to make sense of the world and he said, uh, well, maybe we are all actors in a play and we just don't know it and somebody's already written the script and we're just saying what we're supposed to say and we have the illusion of free will. We just don't know. I choose to believe um, that, you know, we have free will and what we do matters. If we zoom out in terms of time and space and uh, we go into somewhere outside of our galaxy uh, and we forward, uh, I don't know, three gazillion trillion years ahead then nothing uh, objectively nothing i do today will matter to anything that exists in three trillion years but because it matters to me and i position myself like that i make my existence meaningful 
I have to just live with the possibility of nothing I do matters, but I, I choose to believe that it does. Sure, and I, and I have no problem with that. I mean, you know, everything's pointless.com is not about, you know, denigrating living beings now. It's about saying to people, and a, and a lot of people that I get coming to me are people who are living in, say, you know, oppressive cultures where free thinking is not allowed and where they say, you know, uh, I'm questioning, you know, these basic tenets of my society and everybody's looking at me like a mad person. And it's nice to know that I'm allowed actually as a being to question what other people maybe don't think, you know, they don't question. And I, and yeah. I think you know, that, that's what everything is pointless is about. It's not about saying, slit your wrists, give up, what's the <laughs> point, whatever. Because, you know, that's not what I, I, you know, I say on my blog. And when people communicate with me, it's not about saying to people, you know, yeah, just slit your wrists. Yeah. Um, if you if you want to kill yourself, I mean, I, I'm not here to advocate for life, and you know, and again, this is why I'm an existentialist. This is for you to choose. Your you have to tussle with the the questions as posed, you know, by the universe. I mean, we all yeah. find ourselves in the universe, as yeah, Camus as Camus says, doesn't he? You know, the first the first question is to to kill yourself or not. But mm -hmm. you know, I'm not an advocate for suicide per se. You know, and I, I've had friends kill themselves, and you know. Life is hard. Yeah. Um, but here's where positive psychology comes in, because uh, one of the elements of, of well-being is uh, to, to have autonomy, to have agency, to have uh, this a sense that we can, we can do what we want to a certain extent. And uh, you mentioned uh, people living in oppressive regimes, you know, or people in prison, for example, or teenagers uh, who are being told by their parents what to do. You know, they don't have that sense that they can actually do what they want. And that is one of the things that is most important to human beings, to be able to do what you want. And if we then start to believe that nothing that we do actually matters, um, then that really, really impacts people's well-being. So once it's easy, I can see completely see the point and the possibility of everything being pointless. The thing is that I've seen it's too easy for people who just take that message and don't really process it and think it through and make their own decisions based on it and critically evaluate and and uh, fight against it and then you know come to their own conclusion if they just adopt that message then uh, that that results in in really low well-being and really like people who who kind of give up and they don't really have any motivation to do anything anymore because what's the point you know and i see that quite a lot in in people that they, this kind of lethargy that that results sometimes from from looking at these existential questions and being confronted with the existential givens. It can result in in a loss of, in a loss of energy completely, and you know it takes some time to 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 make meaning out of that. So I, I think it's really important to to see the positive side of that, to see the potential in it. Because if everything's pointless and you're the only one who's giving life meaning or your existence meaning, and there is no overarching meaning or point to it then you can you're free to do whatever the fuck you want there's no rules you make your own rules and right. that is incredibly liberating well exactly i mean I, I for me again why i'm an existentialist and I, and I argue this with quite a few of my correspondents you know who i point out the very fact that you are as you know you are the freest thing in the universe i mean a black hole cannot choose not to be a black hole you know the the you, a galaxy cannot choose to be a galaxy anymore but boy do you have you walk out your door and be a new person because yeah. you can do whatever you want to do and if that is not the freest thing in the universe that i can see then Absolutely. you know that that is, that is a power the, the 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 hard thing is you don't get given a manual there is no you know and and the, i understand it's difficult you know, it's difficult to then decide, well, what am I going to do? What am I going to value? How am I going to live? But, you know, that's life. Sorry, you know, so, sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but, you know, that's life. Well, you're the bearer of good news and you're the bearer of bad news because you're the bearer of both news. I mean, that's, that's well, the inherent paradox, you know. You're saying you're free to do whatever you want and they're like, great. And then you're like, well, now you have to choose. Sure. There's a trillion, gazillion, million different things that you could do with your life. And then the anxiety kicks in because sure. uh, we might miss out. Every choice we make excludes another possibility. Yeah.
And, and, and I mean, and angst is something again, which, you know, I mean, I've experienced it. I mean, I, I don't, I don't experience it anymore. It was something I had an existential break about 10 years ago. And, um, you know, and I, I very much understand the falling down a well and putting your nails into the side of the well and, you know, that, that looking over the edge of a precipice or the, the abyss stares back at you. Um, it, it can be terrifying. Yes. It's it's both. It's always both. <laughs> we seem to have I'm, a voice. I'm that, no. have, no, I've, been, I've, I've been here. For, I've been here for a while, listening very oh, right, attentively. Okay. So thank you for that. And I always become one. Go, oh, <laughs> check check on the time. I mean, there's definitely some points that I'd like to pick up on. Maybe if we pause the moment, maybe the next episode. Absolutely. Um, so this idea of it being terrifying is where we ended it. But immediately <laughs> before that, there was something about it being deeply liberating. But how about let's just pause at that time and if uh, we'll join again with Yannick in the next episode is that okay so Brilliant. let's do that let me get a glass of water as well Cheers. bye 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 for now see you in a sec <laughs>